My name's Jan Marie Garcia. I'm a pediatrician by training. I am right now an assistant professor of nursing at um, the Betty Irene Moore School of Nursing at UC Davis. I am from East San Jose originally, lived all over the country, uh, went to Stanford, um, graduated with, with um, departmental honors in, in the top 15% of my class, went to UCSF, did residency at Oakland Children's Hospital, and then um, slept and, <laughs> and did a master's degree in public health after that at UC, UC some school in the Bay Area, I can't quite remember its name, where I got the MPH from. And then um, I did a fellowship in health policy, and while I was doing that fellowship back at UCSF, um, well, in medical school, one of the most, the most, one of the most important things in my life happened. I married uh, one of, I married my study partner in medical school, Jorge. So, um, and that was 20 years ago, and we still like each other, which is really saying something. <laughs> And our offspring, you guys pass this back because I didn't bring a slide. Um, these are our offspring, Gabriel and Canela, okay? Canela, um, I, you know, both of us were on an academic medicine track. We are both on track to be professors um, at a school of medicine. But when I laid eyes on Canela, everything changed. So, um, I came to realize that I wasn't somebody who could do daycare without my family being around or um, without some, you know, surrogate grandmas around or something like that. We were living in Vallejo at the time and we didn't have family who could take care of Canela. So what I did is I structured, I write. My um, first publication was in the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, it was a senior honors thesis as an undergraduate. Changed my life. Um, had um, an amazing Jewish mentor who helped me do that. Um, and I've always liked to write. So I built a consulting career from home and finished my fellowship part-time and then worked from home. And um, I would also work at the drop-in clinics at Kaiser as a pediatrician. I love that. I love pediatrics. I love it. I mean... Where else can you have a conversation where you ask someone what they want to be when they grow up and they say Batman, <laughs> right? Or the Little Mermaid. And you ask them, well, so does the Little Mermaid actually make enough to pay rent? And they go, uh-huh, <laughs> right? So I, I'm in pediatrics because they teach me how to rescript myself and how to dream and how to believe that everything's possible. We mess them up through a variety of institutions that I'm going to show you, but um, that's why I'm in pediatrics. That's why I tried to stay active clinically until I had Gabriel, and he just took me out of the game. Um, but I used to, with Canela, I would, I would um, get a call during the day about what I was supposed to write for, then it was the California Endowment. I was helping to write their multicultural investment field when they were brand new. And so I, they would say, we need three pages on this, or we need just 10 bullet points on this or that. And then, so I would get that during the day and then put Canela to sleep at night and, and arrange my writing around her breastfeeding schedule. And then um, sometimes I wouldn't sleep at night and I would just beg her to take two naps around Barney and everything else that was going on that day. So that's how I structured my crazy life, and my husband agreed to that. I don't know why, but um, I, there are just going to be some of you who just can't do it, who can't call a complete stranger to take care of your child, and you're not going to be around. And um, the the more flexible you can be with yourself and gentle you can be with yourself. I'm a community activist. I've changed the world in my little corner of the world, Davis, California. I've never stopped being a pediatrician. Just my, my emphasis is on unequal schooling and health, racially unequal schooling and health, and you'll see some of the things that I do there. And um, I just did it right in the schools where my children were. And I used my title as a physician to have some clout and status in the community I learned from Cesar Chavez, from Martin Luther King, from Dolores Huerta, how to make that happen. Um, 
and took my title as a physician um, and, and changed that uh, community in, in ways. You guys are writing a little bit. Can I ask you to, to give me one hour after this, sometime in the next year? There's a movie called From the Community to the Classroom. We don't have internet here. I wanted to show you um, a, a clip of it. But if, if, um, if you would just make sure that you see that film. It's in 20 minute segments, but it's, it's about the work I did with Davis young people, teaching them critical race theory, racial identity development theory, and action research, and how those young people developed, of course, race and social justice in US history that's changing their world and still exists. So that's a little bit about me, um, kind of important, because not a lot of people will talk about that, just about how hard it is, not just as women, but as men, but as women, OK, as women. Because I'll tell you, my, my favorite person in the world is my husband. But even when we were thinking about Canada Carolina and where, where she might go for daycare, he said, I don't get it. She'll be dry and she'll be fed. What's the big deal? So he's like the most, you'll hear, he's like the most sensitive guy in the whole world. But women, we have a different way about us, right? So, so give yourself that freedom. So um, I'm going to talk about scripts real quickly. And I don't have my YouTube videos, which is really um, not going to hamper me, because that's just the way it is. I might have to act out some of them, but um, <laughs> um, we're going to do this, OK? So I want to talk about, I didn't, I didn't title. I know it says cultural humility as a way to transform. Did you see how they just totally jacked my title and put it in the fr on the title page? <laughs> Olivia Campa just jacked it, right? So the scripts is my idea. I'm a little bit famous for something called cultural humility, you guys. Um, I, I um, developed that concept with my mentor. And it wasn't until a couple years ago I started thinking about, you know, how do people do that? How do, if that's not intentional or something about, I think all of us probably in this room will get the concept of cultural humility, but how do you teach it to other folks? And I came across this idea of scripts that we live, intentionally or unintentionally. OK? So um, like Gabriel here, when he <laughs> did the baby. Gabriel, when he was, uh, well, all through his childhood, he wanted to play football. I had to play football. Da, da, da. And you know me as a pediatrician, way ahead of the popular news now. I knew how dangerous it was. I knew. But, but I also grew up at my dad's knee, watching football, Franco Harris, USC, go tr dun 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 and dun, 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 watching the Trojans play Notre Dame, da 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 da. So okay, he's got to play, right? So if he's gonna play, Gabby, he's got to play early, so that the the younger they are, the less likely they are to seriously hurt themselves. Whereas if he had started later like at 15 or 16, now they're so huge. And many of them have been playing for five, six, seven years. You could really damage them. So I, I just said, OK, you, you do that. You, he's a great athlete, phenomenal athlete. So um, this is his football swag right here, OK? And he's just the, the sweetest, um, smartest, uh, gregarious kid. But he, he thought he wanted to play football, and I'm all for it, right? So three weeks into football, no, no, let me say, it wasn't even three weeks. It's the first week of practice. You know, I'm going as mom, you know, and we're there. All the moms are there. Gabby comes over in his helmet, and, he's, and I could see, you know, it's hot and sweaty in there, but I can see he's crying, right? I can see he's crying. I said, Tito, what's wrong? Come, Tito, Tito. Gabrielito Tito. Um, what's wrong, dude? What's wrong? That guy, that one guy hit me in the neck. He hit me right here. I said, oh, yeah, I could see that. It's not, you're not protected by anything. Yeah, yeah. You know. I said, babe, it's football. <laughs> they're they're going to hit you. You know, you, it's contact, dude. I know, I know, but he didn't even say sorry. <laughs> and so I'm like, ooh. 
okay, hmm. I said, okay, okay, it's okay. Get back in there. You're not supposed to say sorry every time you get hit in football, babe. That's just not the script, right? And so he goes, I said, did you tell your coach that you got hurt? He said, I told him, and he didn't even care. So there's my baby in this football helmet. I mean, what kind Talk about a disconnect between, between scripts, right? I'm like, so he's like, Mommy, I don't want to play anymore. I just don't want to play. Well, two, a couple of things happened. He played the whole season, and Mommy stopped coming to practice, okay? That was the last time I went to practice. So I said, dude, <laughs> no, you're playing the whole season because you've bugged me for three years. We paid $300. Your cleats, cleats cost 60 and we've, you've got a position, nose tackle, and we've got a carpool. You're finishing the season, okay? So he would, poor Gabby, he's, he's a baller. He's a basketball player now, but he would be like, oh, just 21 more days of practice. He was one of the best players, but 21 more days, Mom, 10 more days of practice. And in the end, the, the coaches asked him to come back and, and uh, come back the next year. And Gabby, you know, is like, he identified what was going on, right? He said, Mom, I don't want to do that. The coaches yell at you, and they think it makes you play better, but all it does is make me afraid to mess up. He's like that. Both my kids are deep, but he's really like it. So he got the script, right? The testosterone male script that I needed him to get, right? And to see as a script that he could identify and he didn't want to be part of. Put me in a situation where people are for my best, are helping me for my best. But just to yell at me, just to, just to be a bunch of dads up there making sure your kid's the quarterback or the running back and then I get yelled at for stuff I don't even know, he's like, I don't like that script. But he played it. And he need, how many of you guys know the guys need to know what the testosterone script is? Because it comes up in work, it comes up in all kind of stuff, right? Even if you opt out, you need to know it. Hello? We're going to talk about the scripts that we live in, how, how you got to identify those scripts. I can tell you about cultural competence. I can tell you about you need the 10 things you need to know about Cambodian patients. You know how we do cultural competence, right? Um, OK, don't, don't touch the head. Don't. But really, it's about deep internal scripts that we have about the value, the differential value of people. That's not about knowing about them, as important as that is. It's about getting clear about us, about me. Hello? OK? I'm probably the only African American here talking besides Dr. Lattimore. So today, we're going to talk very briefly about cultural humility. Or we'll talk a lot about cultural humility. And then we'll talk about issues of race, power, and identity. And then I'm going to try and make visible for you some unspoken social scripts um, that we hold for ourselves and for other people. Can you engender trust in a relationship? And do people get from you that you want to hear about their deepest needs? Because sometimes race and culture don't have anything to do with that clinical encounter. Sometimes it has everything to do with it. Sometimes it has half. How do you find that out? How much culture has to do, or race, or racism, or language by it? How, how do you find that out? Let's say you know it. You know it all. In fact, you're la you, you know, your, your family's from Agos Calientes, like Cortez family, and Delta. you know, you got this. You got this. Um, how do you know that that person isn't thinking of their night shift or their kid's college tuition or something that doesn't have? How do you know? Hello? You, you have to ask them, and they have to trust that you want to hear it. Because some of the stuff we do, our own scripts, especially around illness, are kind of silly to people who are not us. So the biggest skill is 
in relationship building and trust building. Cultural humility has to do with not I got a 15 on this or I scored a 45 or great, I broke 30 on the MCATs. Or There's not a cultural competence test like that. It's a lifelong process, you guys. Commitment to really hard questions about yourself. And when you mess up, not if you mess up, when you mess up, do people know that you see yourself as a learner? Or are they going to get from you that you're so invested in your own notion of competence that you can't even admit that you made a mistake? And you're getting defensive. You immediately get, oh, I didn't mean that. You know, my, my, uh, my next door neighbor is Native American, and I, you know, no, because no. And, um, or are you just, you know, that's the third mistake I made. Can you teach me? What, what would have been a better way to say that? Even as an African-American woman, you guys, I've blown it with African-American patients. Because believe it or not, you may have a community that you identify with culturally and by your background, but that's not necessarily how people see you, right? They see you as UC Davis, the home of Alan Bakke and uh, the death of affirmative action. Or they see you as whatever. All of your institutions that you come from have histories in that community that are not good. You are, you are seen as part of that institution, y'all, until you prove yourself differently. You get that? Okay, so you, it's not about, I'm nice, I know Spanish, I, I'm bicultural, I'm, I spent three months in Costa Rica. I'd, nobody wants to hear that. Who are you right now in this room? And can I trust you with my deepest fears? So you gotta, you gotta be a lifelong learner. This isn't, oh, I heard uh, Dr. Jan's um, workshop, and so now I, you're on a lifelong developmental journey. Redressing power imbalances in the patient-clinician dynamic. So you guys, you, even as a medical student, you have incredible power over people's lives. You are not undressing in front of them. You are not going to ask that parent to leave the adolescent with you. Or you are going to ask that parent to leave the adolescent with you alone in that room. You, even as a medical student, you may not see yourself this way, but there is a differential power imbalance. And you got to work to mitigate that. That's cultural humility. Cultural competence says, I got this. I'm an expert. I'm wearing the white coat. I'm not supposed to mess up. I took the, I took the weekend um, in service on um, the Arab American patient. And then developing mutually beneficial and non-paternalistic relationships with community so that you have a source of relevant information coming at you all the time because you're out there in the community. Because if you make a mistake, you're gonna call up your, your um, Mian colleague. You're gonna call up your um, African American colleague and say, well, I just can't get it right with this. Or the, the non-medical community advocate. Okay? Don't, don't leave behind community, you guys. Okay, here we go. So I'm not going to ask for the answer, so just relax. Everybody take a deep breath. Okay, guess the community. Members of a minority, many of whom were brought to the country as slave labor, are at the bottom of the social ladder. They do the dirty work when they have work. The rest of the society considers them violent and stupid and discriminates against them. Over the years, tension between minority and majority has occasionally broken out in deadly riots. In the past, minority children were compelled to go to segregated schools and did poorly academically. Even now, minority children drop out of school relatively early and often get into trouble with the law. Schools with many minority children are seen as problem-ridden. So majority parents sometimes move out of the school district or send their children to private schools. 
and as might be expected, the minority children do worse on standardized tests than majority children do. What is this community? Roxanne. African Americans? African Americans where? In the South? Okay, anybody else? Latinos in California? Could be. Could be. Anybody else? Any other guesses? So, you guys, this is Koreans in Japan. Do you see the script? It's a script of the minority anywhere in the world. If you see it as if you see it as, what is a script that reproduces inequality? Not just in healthcare, but in incarceration rates and standardized test scores and how we do in education otherwise and who wants to live next to us. That's not the African American's problem. That's not the undocumented immigrant's problem. That's a phenomenon of what we do to each other. Do you see it as a script? You guys get it? So it's not about who's on the bottom and how we need to fix them and give them parenting classes and, um, and teach them this and fill them up this way so they can be like. It's about the system, our agreements, the scripts that we hold collectively that we reproduce generation after generation. Hello? As a physician, you gotta do your one-on-one. -on -one. Not everybody can be like me and address the systemic issues. But you also cannot stop with how we demonize families, how we belittle families, how we chi-square what families do or people do. You gotta see it as a process, a script that you are complicit with, or you intentionally like the Hunger Games, anybody? You remember Katniss when, when Rue Re, Re, Re died? She intentionally opted out of that script of we're against each other. I'm going to rehumanize her by burying her, and I'm going to give my revolutionary signal. Because you recognize that you're playing a script, you've got to play it now can't go up to your professors tomorrow, Monday, and say, you know what, dude, I know what you're doing, <laughs> right? <laughs> but you got to be gangster about it. Somewhere hold it in your heart. Make an agreement with it, what you're going to play, knowing you're playing it. But when you ask kids to bring their best, don't, don't, don't belittle that kid. Because sometimes I think kids are the most honest among us, right? And they're telling you, I know what you want from me. I know you want me to try hard, and the whole system is rigged against me. I'm not playing that script. You, so you can, you can, if you know this, then you can say, dude, I know what it is you're up against. But take back the power. Transform the script. Don't be complicit in the school to prison pipeline. Don't be complicit in what it takes to get HIV because you're just not thinking about your future. They're not thinking about your future. You got to think about your future. Hello? What's the purpose of a script, you guys, real quick? Order. Would you say more about order? Control. control. Say more about control. What are you controlling? You're controlling those people and what else? how to act in different situations. But, but really, just like a theater script, what's the purpose of it? Yeah, dude. If you could see that, that people hand us roles. Yeah? Do people hand you roles in medical school? Somebody, it was just right after 209, Proposition 209 passed, and one out of the two Latina uh, students at UC San Diego, I was in one of these conferences and she says, yeah. Everyone comes up to me and says, oh, you're the one. People hand you a script? 
It's a prescribed role. If you, can't, if you don't see it, you can't opt out of it. You can't transform that script. Okay? Absolutely. So scripts are really important. So we don't start out with Les Miserables and end up with Medea. I can do bad all by myself. Anybody? <laughs> right? So we don't just go off. Scripts are so the outcome is the same. Hello? Generation after generation, ideally after generation. Some of y'all getting this. What's your name, brother? Mauricio. Mauricio's getting this. He's like, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I know what she's talking about. Uh-oh, here we go. So um, this book I love, The Hero Within, Six Approaches, Six Archetypes We Live By, Kind of Personality Types, um, you know, the, these uh, personality um, caricatures that some of us fall into. Carol Pearson says, most of us are slaves to the stories we unconsciously tell ourselves about our lives. Freedom begins the moment we become conscious of the plot line we are living and with insight recognize that we can step into another story altogether. Our experiences of life quite literally are defined by our assumptions. We make up stories about the world and to a great degree live out their plots. What our lives are like then depends on the scripts we consciously, consciously have adopted. That's why I think generation after generation health disparities persist. Because somehow we're all implicitly agreeing to a script for one another. Yeah, and, yeah, and the people who are teaching you to dismantle that inequality don't even know they're playing a role. You know Harriet Tubman? Hello, anybody? Okay, she said, I freed a thousand slaves. I could have freed a thousand more had they realized they were slaves. What? Had they realized they were playing a script. How many of our young people are playing down to a script, somebody else? Are you guys playing down to a script in your medical schools? Are you being the serious gangster generation of Latino leaders? that you are, right? Adela de la Torre told me this is the first year for the University of California that Latinos were the biggest group of applicants. It's here. And guess what? You happen to be here poised as leaders during this amazing time. I'm watching. I'm watching because I want to see how you guys treat the rest of the minorities. Will you reproduce the we are number one? Are you gonna do it in a different way? You guys hear me? When do we learn uh, the American script of race? Very, very early. You know the doll experiments where I t a, girl like, a, a girl like me um, where um, you take a, a dark doll and a light doll and the kids, even before preschool, if you ask them, who's a good friend? Who's the smartest in your class? Even the black children, 60% of the time, brown children too will choose the white doll. It's in there, that script is in there. This for me, this is what, this is the most powerful script. It's, it's a minute long, it's a YouTube video. Look at it under, um, the child psychology of white supremacy. And if you guys, you guys know that it's not white people that are the problem. Because I just told you it's the Koreans against the Japanese. The Japanese against the Korean. It's the Rwandans, right? Somebody convinced the Rwandans that they were different from one another. Somebody sold them a script that the Hutus were better than the Tutsis and the Tutsis were better you guys, they didn't even know who they were. I just heard on NPR one Rwanda woman said, we didn't even know. We got people on both sides. So where did that script come from? Come on, y'all. Where are my Mexican people? Come on, y'all. I had just learned this 
uh, in the last five years doing these trainings. I didn't know the people in China really work to be light-skinned. You don't go out in the sun. All these people carrying the umbrellas. What? Wearing gloves and, and, and bleaching, bleaching. Some, the Indian people from India. What the heck? Where did that script? We are beautiful people. Do you get it? Not the white people's fault, y'all. Because you know what? We're marching to a script we don't have to play. This is the intervention I think that needs to happen for disparities to be eliminated. That we get really clear about how we learn race in this country. How we learn to be minorities or minor citizens. How does the script of race play out intergenerationally to produce, reproduce um, cultural disparities? You'll see Amanda in the last part of that film, From the Community to the Classroom. Her dad graduated from Cal, I believe, with a degree in statistics. He's a high-level UC researcher, does, does, runs numbers all the time, labor statistics. Amanda's mom is a social worker at the medical center. She's one of the kids I helped train to do this research. Her dad is El Salvadorian. Her mom is Mexican from farm workers. Um, Esther, her mom, tells a story of how when she was at Davis High School as a kid, as a graduate, the teachers kind of felt like she was really smart. She probably didn't have to work in the fields, so maybe she should apply at Lucky's. Okay, Esther went on to be a social worker. Powerful social worker in our, our dementia clinic, Alzheimer's clinic. Here comes Amanda. Goes through Spanish immersion. Speaks English perfectly. Speaks Spanish perfectly. Raised by her grandma in terms of child care, da, da, da. She is not poor. She is not undocumented. She is not monolingual Spanish. Nor are her parents. She gets into high school, Davis High School, in the top 10 high schools in the state. Goes to Honors English. The teacher says, are you sure you're supposed to be in here? Makes a point in front of all her peers. Are you sure you're in the right class? First day of school. Amanda's writing essay for Cal Berkeley, where her parents went and for UCLA, where she really wants to go. Counselor comes along and says, wait, those schools are really hard to get into. She says, oh yeah, I know. She says, so wh what are you doing that? Wow. Or, she says, no, I, kn I know, I know. And it was several rounds of why are you even doing that before Amanda had to step, you know how we get angry? You you know the defiance of authority suspension? So Amanda says, wait a minute. My parents went to college. My parents went to Cal. What the heck? Don't buy the line that it's only about economic class or education level or language ability. Amanda looks straight up Latin. They're not, we are not looking at her and expecting excellence from her. We're tolerating less than the best, because that's what we see. I don't want anybody in here, when you get to be leaders, to ever look down on a brown person. I know, you guys think I don't know. I know. You, oh, you're so Indian, right? Priyatita Chula. Look down on your families after you get a little edumacation. Hello? There'll be one or two of you in here that'll do so much damage to us as people of color.
because you think you're different than the rest of us. You really believe somebody else has a different script for you than they put on us. Maybe you had a few more lucky breaks and you're not admitting it. The learning that you are a minority, a minor citizen, is most powerful in school. Most powerful. Why? Because your parents get in trouble if they don't send you. It's legally mandated. It's, it's, it's scripted as this is good for you. You sit, like my daughter, my black daughter, you sit and you listen to me read Tom Sawyer out loud while you cringe and people look at you. That's good for you. It's literature. Hello? Legally mandated, you have to be there six, seven, eight hours a day with people who disdain this kind of training, who don't value it. We could have the achievement gap closed tomorrow, y'all. I ain't playing. Check this out. So in Davis, the gifted and talented label is huge. The schools are excellent. 95% of the teachers are certified in their fields to teach in their fields. We don't have overwhelming poverty. Uh, we don't have a, a ton of English language learners. We just don't. We should have no achievement gap. And those of us like me who are there, who are black, are not there because it's culturally enriching and electric for a black person. Davis is the only city I've ever been followed in, and it's happened to me three times that I know of. Jorge and I are there for the schools. And I kind of regret it every day because we bought that script. Because my kids have been damaged. Hello? So, if you're in Davis, 30% of the kids are labeled as gifted. So 70% of the kids are labeled as, I'm like, oh, no, no, no. When I came here, I was like, oh, no. I, oh, no. What? And you know, everyone is above average. Everyone's scores are boop. Even the, even the colored folks' scores are way off the chart. I mean, you don't need a gifted program. Everyone is gift. Everyone's accelerated. So let's provide that critical thinking and that label and that to everybody. You're already doing it to 30% because in our city you go to a different class at a different school after you pass a 45 minute IQ test in third grade. And you are automatically tracked in junior high school based on that third grade test. Is this ridiculous? These are upper middle class people who cannot get enough of privilege. You are privileged to live there. And yet you gotta have that script of it's not enough. My kid won't be okay unless he has all the toys. That's an American script, isn't it? So check it out. We also have, on top of that IQ test, we have private testing. So you can pay for your kid to get tested outside of the universal testing. Universal testing was there because the year we started our activism, there were hardly any black and brown kids in the gifted program. And when the school board found out, the phenomenon was a teacher had to recommend you to sit for the gate test. That year, no black or brown third graders in the entire city were recommended to sit for the gate test. Okay, so now we have private testing. It's always been the case. And if you look here, over 30% of the white students who are, in, who, who are in the gifted program are there because they were privately tested compared to hardly any of the blacks and the Latinos. Same with the Asian Americans who are largely Korean. I'm not talking about Laotian. They're Korean and Chinese. This is institutional scripting of Who's more intelligent? It's an artificial source of inequality that nonetheless teaches kids every day. White and Asian people must be. Oh, and the script is, oh no, our kids just learn differently. The down low script is, you don't want your kids with those. <laughs> you want to make sure they get into junior high, tracked into the higher courses. 
or else, quote, they will be in classes with the loser kids. But this, see how subtly, you guys, your challenge as leaders in the next generation is to figure out in healthcare, because you know this ACA thing is working, right? Healthcare reform, Obamacare. I want to challenge you guys, you know one person in your age group who has not signed up. One person on your Facebook post who has not signed up. Black president goes down. Okay, we got five million people signed up, so it cannot be taken away by the Republicans. But it can be bankrupt if, if not enough people in your generation sign up. You guys get that? Please go home. Make sure your cousin, your boopy doop, your boopy doop who works for a, a company that doesn't have enough, you know, to give health care, make sure they sign up, please. You got a couple more days. But you're gonna be leaders in health care and you're gonna have to be gangsters and ninjas to figure out how is the system reproducing unequal access? Because we don't have mothers and fathers who don't want their kids to get care. Yeah? I've heard that before. They don't bring their kids in for care. Mexican. The doctor told me that. ER doctor. They don't bring their kids in until they're really sick. I'm going to go on. You know that there's neurology that says that we're scripted to see difference. You guys know that? That, that we can do flow MRIs? When I show you a picture of a homeless person, stereotypically homeless person, disheveled, unshaven. A, pit, a, a place in our brain lights up in the amygdala. I can show you that. It's the same place that lights up when I show you feces, mutilated body parts. Hello? Anything not human that's just so gross to you. When I ask you what that person is, going to have for lunch, the other parts of your brain light up. So some people that, that say that's a human being like me, I don't know, what would I like to have for lunch? I don't know. And I grew up in East San Jose, people call the Vietnamese people boat people, but no. They were my tennis partners and my physics partners. I'm not talking, but there is bias in me. Okay, so what I learned to do for the Laotian patient was whenever I saw that, that surname, because I knew I had a potential for bias, I would take half a second, a millisecond, and say, Jan, this is going to be a different interaction. It's not going to be call and response. They care about their kid as much as you would care about your kid. They are not stupid. I would self-talk that because I had identified a group of people that I have a really hard time with. Five minutes. Okay, I had a lot more, obviously, to talk about. Ooh, there's Harriet Tubman. Remember that, I freed a thousand slaves. I could have freed a thousand more if only they knew they were slaves. So many of our community are saying, I don't want to do Obamacare. I'm not political. Rewrite the script. Right? Like I said, I could go in, hurry, took more time, it took more emotional energy for me to say, I'm broken. I'm as biased as anybody in the room. I'm as racist as anybody in the room. Get over yourself. I am not colorblind. I'm not. So in what ways is this patient at risk for lower quality care from me. Hello? You're not going to get a lot of congratulations for thinking that from your superiors, from your senior medical students or your residents or your attendings. And I would encourage you to pick your battles because people don't see it this way. Okay? You have to make it through medical school, but you guys, I know you're so young. In the blink of an eye, you will be that senior medical student. You will be that person on the admissions committee. You will be that resident. You will be that attending. In the blink of an eye, just learn. 
Learn, learn, learn. Don't shoot yourself in the foot. Hold it in your heart. It will come. Your time will come when you will say, I remember I was down in Fresno doing a senior medicine resident um, clerkship. Been a long time. And I knew I was going to be a pediatrician. These folks didn't mean anything to me. The patients meant a lot. I learned a lot from the senior people. But there is this, this woman who had what everyone said. She was a Mexican woman, older, frail, 70-something. She had zoster and 10 dermatomes on both sides of her body. Everyone said it was the worst zoster they had ever seen. She was requiring so much pain medication and still was very uncomfortable. So one of the residents said, well, that's just III syndrome, the hysterical Hispanic female, which is a script that was very uh, common in the generation of people behind you, and you'll still hear it. So I'm like straight up, like I don't, I don't care what the letter looks like. I'm like, what? You just told me that this is the worst zoster you ever saw. How are you going to straight up say the lady's faking or culturally playing? Oh, no, no, no. See, my husband is from Peru, and he's the one who told me about the hysterical. That's what they do. And I'm like, wait a minute. So I would never tell you to challenge someone who's holding their future in your hands, because it'll come soon enough. But don't you dare be somebody who does, turns around and does that to another group of people. I have a four-week race and health institute. As a medical student, you guys are all welcome to it. If you want to come up to Davis for four weeks, we just talk about this stuff. We don't see one patient. We go out in the community. We interview elder black folk. We go out to a farm in rural um, Yolo County just to touch the dirt, not to know how hard farm work is but to re-script ourselves that this is dignified work that if it wasn't done, we wouldn't eat. And what does that mean for how that person should be received when they come into our health system with their dirty nails or whatever it is that grosses us out? You guys, hello? So I have devoted my life to creating those environments where we can challenge ourselves and it doesn't mean anything about our value. It just means we're lifelong learners. It just means that we're scripted, that it's in there in ways that we don't even realize.